Herbs are doing things that our foods no longer have the capacity to do. So these, this, so we're getting this rich phytochemistry that's protecting our cells. So beyond just eating well and doing all the things that we need to do from a lifestyle point of view, taking herbs gives you just this huge boost of, of cellular resilience that, it, it, wow, it's powerful. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your background and how you got started into the, in the cellular wellness world? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. It, <laughs> by accident, nothing planned. You know, I, I went to medical school and was really attracted to obstetrics and gynecology because it dealt with people who were generally well and bringing life into the world. And it was really a healthy, fun population, but it came with really rigorous night call. And I was practicing on a small town on the coast of North Carolina where I was taking call every second to third night, every second to third weekend. And I was one of those people that if I had people in the hospital or in labor or whatever, I just didn't sleep very well. Plus, when I was off, it's like, ah, I don't really have time to sleep because I've got so much else I want to do in life. And 30s, I could do it by the time I hit 40 everything just caught up with me and my body mm. crashed in a way that I didn't expect in a way that the conventional medical system seemed to be at a loss to really help me and ended up turning to herbal therapy almost by default, got my life back. And, and then it was like, wow, this is remarkable. And I really need to do investigate this. So I spent the past 10 years really figuring out how the herbs had helped me and what's going on, what was going on in my body. So you said something that was really poignant that 90% of healing is actually from self-care. Can you talk about that more? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> that's kind of what the whole book, the premise of the book, I think we turn to the medical establishment to, you know, fix us whenever we don't feel well. And I think we're asking the medical system to do something really it's not designed to do. You know, mm. the medical system does an exceptionally good job of stabilizing illness. You know, if you're acutely ill, like you break your leg or have a heart attack, or even in chronic illness, what drugs do and what surgical procedures do, all these things we do is stabilize that really bad situation. But herbs don't really have the potential to truly promote healing. You know, they stabilize the body so it can heal, but they're not doing anything to push it in that direction. So in chronic illness, you know, unless you're dealing, getting, affecting those stress factors that are precipitating the illness, you're just not going to get well. And our system really isn't designed to help people do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, well, I mean, obviously it all started out with well intention, I believe, but we've gotten to a place where it's no longer just about acute care, which is a really important component of healthcare. But we have doctors that were taught how to do, how to perform acute care, but we have so many people that have chronic illnesses now that yeah. they, I believe, are not fully equipped to address because it's a, it's a totally different approach. We try to manage chronic illness with acute intervention, right? Mm. If you have high blood pressure, we don't give you things that restore your vascular system back to normal so your blood pressure normalizes. We artificially block the elevated blood pressure. And as long as you're on a medication to do that, then your blood pressure will stay down. But as soon as you go off the medication, then it'll pop right back up. You know, interestingly, I was diagnosed with essential hypertension when I was in my 30s. If I went mm -hmm. in to see a, a doctor at any given time, routine physicals, my blood pressure would be 150 over 100 or greater. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, this is essential hypertension. We don't really know what it causes it. You can take medicines for it. It will get, wor it will get worse over time. So all the, all the medications really made me feel bad. So I was kind of like, yeah, you're just going to have to live with it. Along came this health crisis and I kind of forgot about that and did the herbs and then just kept doing the herbs. And I've been taking herbs and doing lifestyle interventions and that sort of thing for 15 years. My blood pressure went to normal completely. Wow. 
Now at 65, on any given visit, it'll be 115, 120, over 70 to 80, perfectly normal every single time. So, you know, so so what the herbs are doing is normalizing that. So they don't work as acutely as a drug. Yeah, it's, you know, taking the drug right up front could save a person's life, but they want to fix your vascular system where the herbs have the potential to help restore normal. And that's what's so remarkable about them. We need to get to a place where we have two different buckets. You know, we, we go see a doctor, we go to the hospital for acute care for, you know, an accident or something like that. But then when we're dealing with something, for example, like hypertension that you were dealing with, we need to have doctors that are trained to go about this in a new approach instead of just putting a drug putting you on a drug that's going to have other symptoms that you're then going to have to have another drug to mask those symptoms we need to get to the root cause and start uh practicing preventative wellness preventative care which yeah. is what your book is essentially all about yeah yeah it's it's uh, you know it it does take the whole thing down to the cellular level which i think does change the playing field and how you look at that spectrum between wellness and illness so it it but you know it it's we doctors are trained to in that acute intervention and i you know and it takes a lot of time and training to get them there so we need people like you and health coaches and others who are trained to help people help themselves and, you know, really look at the value of prevention. So I think our, our healthcare system needs to pay attention to that, but you know, it's, it's, it's an issue of our whole society and culture that we need to be, everyone needs to be paying attention and we all need to be talking about it because it's so important. This notion of on a cellular level, I think is really important for people to understand. So when you say that, what do you mean exactly? Like, what does that look yeah. like implementing it? Yeah, it, you know, it, it, it took me a long time to kind of come around to this, but <laughs> it's uh, our, looking at it at the cellular level just makes everything work. And the deal is that anything is simpler if you take it down to its smallest functional unit, right? So your cell phone is a unit, a 747 is a unit. And if something breaks in your cell phone or a 747, it needs to be fixed or it's not going anywhere. Your body is a composite of trillions of individual functional units that we call cells which means that our cells are all working together to do things. So everything that happens in the body is a function of cells. So it, it's, it's not like the heart is a single unit. It's a composite of billions of cells. So, you know, it can, it can shed cells. Cells can go bad and it can keep right on going, which is what makes our body so special. So it's it's the needs of our cells that are so important as far as health. And, you know, it it's so when you have symptoms, a symptom basically is cells that have been stressed or injured. You know, if you step wrong and twist your ankle, you've injured cells in your ankle. And a couple of things happen. One, the the, those cells that are injured release chemical substances that activate nerves that tell your brain something is wrong. So you feel it as pain, but you lose that function. You can't walk on the ankle. So it's the same thing with any kind of group of cells that are injured. Like if you block a coronary vessel, you starve the cells in your heart and you feel it as chest pain, but your heart doesn't work as well. So any symptom that you have is a reflection of cells in the body that are stressed. So looking at that, you know, what we try to do is, well, let's take a medicine or whatever just to get rid of the symptom, but that's artificially blocking those, those signals that are going to the brain. It doesn't necessarily heal the cells. So when you start looking at, you know, symptoms from a point of view of cells, you start asking the question, okay, well, what's stressing the cells? 
So with something like a heart attack or, you know, a sprained ankle, it's pretty obvious. And, you know, you, you unblock the vessel or, or use crutches for a while and all of that area will heal. Well, what healing is, is the ability of cells to recover from stress, to repair internal damage and regenerate new cells. So that looking at healing, so what chronic illness is and chronic symptoms is when the stresses are ongoing and cells can't recover. So it's you, you change that conversation to say what's stressing the cells. And that's very different from how do we suppress the symptom or how do we slow down disease process? You know, we want to promote cellular recovery. And so when you ask that, there are really only five categories of things that affect cellular stress. And it simplifies things. So it's food. It's what you eat. Are you nourishing yourselves? And are they getting everything that they need? You know, oxygen and blood flow. Are you polluting your body with toxic substances, you know, from the food you eat or air that you breathe? Are you stressed? Because when we are pushing that stress button all the time, it overtaxes our cells. So our cells need downtime to rest. So when we're pushing our cells by excessive stress and not getting sleep, they don't get that downtime. They can't recover. So everything starts breaking down. Exercise, being sedentary, as you know, so trauma, damage can damage cells, but being sedentary can because we need blood flow. You know, blood flow moves fluid and bathes our cells and helps us get rid of toxic substances. Then the last one, and we'll talk about this more as we go along, is microbes. We are exposed to bacteria and viruses and protozoa and stuff all the time, and they are a direct threat to the cells of our body. While we're here, why don't we just dive into that a little bit? I know a lot of people I've seen a lot of videos of people talking about this online, like parasites and the bacteria and different bacteria that we're being exposed to. What, how do we keep ourselves from getting these parasites or how do we address them? There's a lot of questions about them right now. It is. And I've been diving into these questions for a decade and a half. So part of my story was I eventually identified with chronic Lyme disease because I found mm -hmm. that I was carrying some of those microbes. Since then, I've kind of even moved beyond that idea of diagnosis altogether. And what's emerging is this picture that our relationship with microbes is a whole lot more complicated than anybody possibly imagined. You know, I think everybody knows we have microbes in our gut or bacteria in our gut, bacteria on our skin. That's pretty much a known fact. But this there's an emerging concept of something called dormant microbes or dormant microbiome. In other words, all these things we pick up, whether it's from tick bites or flea bites or respiratory infections or putting stuff in, in our mouths when we were a kid or COVID or uh, influenza, we're exposed to an awful lot of microbes. And not only that, it's also been found that some of these microbes actually, the, this, some of our microbes in our gut and our skin trickle across into our bloodstream. So things are getting inside our body a lot more than we realize. And these things can, can enter our cells. Many of them are intracellular. So many bacteria, all viruses, and some protozoa have the capacity to live inside of our cells. They, they want to get inside of our cells because that's where the nutrients are, that's where resources are, but it's also protection from the immune system. Um, but it, as it turns out, if your cells are healthy, one mechanism, that, one thing that can happen is the microbes can become dormant inside the cells. And it turns out that there's pretty good evidence accumulating that that's happening all through our lifetime and we have things. Epstein-Barr, toxoplasmosis, chlamydia, mycoplasma, and the list just goes on and on. And that's just what we know about. But as long as they're dormant, 
it doesn't necessarily affect the function of our cells. There's even some suggestions that there may be even some symbiosis that, uh, the, that our cells need this. So you have to remember, though, that a bacteria is like 100 to 1,000 times smaller than one of our cells. So our cells can harbor bacteria that are really small. They can be dormant, and it doesn't affect the cell at all. And we may have that scattered all through our body, in our heart, in our brain, tissues, everywhere. In fact, there's growing evidence that that's exactly the case. So if you're, you're healthy, your cells are healthy, you're eating a good diet, you don't have a toxin overload, you're getting eight hours of sleep at night, you exercise every day, you're going to be okay. But if those things aren't happening, like in my case, all that lack of sleep, not going, you know, going just hour, days after day, day after day without getting a decent night's sleep for 20 years, all that caught up and it stressed my cells to the point that those microbes started reactivating. And your body goes from an environment that favors healthy cells to one that favors microbe growth and the microbes start breaking down cells, breaking down red, cell, red blood cells to release iron because they, they need iron to function. And uh, it's, it's really a fascinating concept because when you look at it, it starts explaining why people are chronically ill. And we have different chronic illnesses because, and, you know, part, part of this, we're, we're still in the early stages of figuring this out, you know, but, but, the theories are intriguing because you look at it and it's just a very logical model. And again, we have different illnesses because we all picked up different microbes and different microbes have different propensity for different cells in the body. So, you know, we're all a little bit different. Our risk is different. It may come out differently in one way than another way, but it gets back to that root of cellular stress. So if you can address those, those issues of cellular stress, then you can do wonderful things. And, you know, that's what I was doing with herbs, though at the time I wasn't aware of it. You know, it really is a testament to the importance of staying healthy and being resilient. It's, I believe what you're talking about is essentially terrain theory that we, we will be constantly throughout our lives exposed to bacteria, protozoas, viruses, and our, the way our body responds is going to be determining determinant on how healthy we are. And that comes down to the cellular level that you're talking about, how stressed we are, if we're getting enough sleep, the toxins in our body. And so it's a great reminder that it's really important to stay healthy for a multitude of reasons. And one of them being that we're resilient yeah. to all these things that are beyond our control. Absolutely. You know, that, that, that's it. You know, it, it's so there's so many things that, that you can do to stay healthy. And it becomes more important as we age because what aging is from a cellular point of view is loss of functional cells. You know, over time, our cells gradually run out of energy and we have the ability to make new cells and generate new cells, but there are limits on that. So you, you reach peak cell count at around age 20. At that point in life, you have five to 10 times more cells than you really need. And all your cells are brand new. But as you go through life, your cells gradually lose function and you lose cells. And so your ability to counter cellular stress, fight off microbes, all of that sort of thing is, is decreased. But, you know, what I can tell you is I'm living a very healthy life at age 65 because I am doing the things that I need to do to keep the cells that I have left at pink functionality and keeping all of my cells healthy. And that keeps me more resilient. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really important. I think we, it, it's a societal thing that we have been told that, you know, as you get older, like, oh, this is just part of getting older. And there is a certain component of that, the things that people are suffering from as they get older. But I, we're not being told that there's a lot of that that we can minimize by staying healthy and we can support our cellular health and support our mitochondria so that we don't have to just, you know, put our heads back and say, well, you know, this is just happening because I'm aging and I'm getting older. It's like, no, there's a lot of things that we can do to make yeah. sure that we're still vital and thriving 
into our older age. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, none of us live forever. You know, I've no. got that. I, I'm aging. I haven't stopped the aging process, but hey, I'm 65 and I'm still kite surfing. And that's, you awesome. know, <laughs> that's and at age 50, I didn't think I would be doing those things. So yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, that's an inspiration. So I know herbs, you've mentioned herbs a couple of times, and those are a huge part of your cellular wellness solution. How can we utilize plants to support our cells? Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it really just, it's very logical. I mean, you think about it, plants have all the same stress factors we do, free radicals, toxic substances, you know, physical stress, and definitely microbes of every variety. And plants have to protect their cells. All living things have to have a system of protection. So the system of, of plant protection is, is chemical. We call, you know, all plants are producing substances called phytochemicals. And they provide pro protection, but they're also chemical messengers that coordinate functions cellular functions. And a lot of those things are like our hormones and chemical messengers in our body. So when we take the herb, we basically gain the plant's regulatory system to, to restore homeostasis and cellular protection system. The plants we define as herbs are plants that humans have been using to promote health for hundreds or thousands of years. So, of course, all plants don't work. You know, nobody would eat poison ivy twice. But these things we define as herbs just mesh well with our biochemistry. And uh, so that extends into the food plants. But the herbs are doing things that our foods no longer have the capacity to do. So these, this, so we're getting this rich phytochemistry that's protecting our cells. So beyond just eating well and doing all the things that we need to do from a lifestyle point of view, taking herbs gives you the, just this huge boost of, of cellular resilience that, it, it, wow, it's powerful. Mm. It's cool. That is very cool. It's exciting. So in your opinion, what are some of the most powerful ones? Can you name a couple? Oh, gosh, there's so many good ones. But, you know, I have my standard list. These are herbs that I take every day. So when I'm looking for herbs for that purpose of prevention, balancing, restorative properties, we're looking for herbs that don't have drug-like properties. So there's certainly some plants that have chemicals in in them that do, you know, have drug-like actions. And people are looking for those for certain purposes. So I'm more looking for herbs that don't have drug-like effects. And in doing so, you know, we have herbs that are safe. They don't cause adverse reactions. Their, their functions are primarily protective and balancing. So those things you can take on a daily basis. And, you know, you don't really worry. And you know, it's not like taking a drug. You could take it the rest of your life and you would be fine. So one herb is rhodiola. That's a favorite of mine. Grows in Siberia. It also can be found in the Appalachians of North Carolina, uh, the Appalachian Mountains of North America. Uh, so, you know, we, it's, that's the thing. You know, you find similar plants all over the world. But rhodiola grows in a harsh, cold climate, generally at a higher altitude. So the the phytochemistry that it's producing is really good for helping us become more resilient to physical and mental stresses. It protects the heart, it increases oxygenation of tissues, really good for all the organs in the body and all the cells, you know, basically we're protecting cells. But it's, it's considered an adaptogen, which means it balances stress hormones that, um, you know, when we're, when we're stressed, when we've pushed ourselves too hard, it can kind of tone that down a bit. And uh, so rhodiola is really good for that. Turmeric, everybody's heard of that one. Wonderful anti-inflammatory herb. People in India consume about a gram of, of turmeric a day in curry. And it is felt to be one of the reasons why they have such a low rate of Alzheimer's and cancer in India. Mm. 
Um, so turmeric is a really nice one. Rishi mushroom, you know, it's a mushroom, it's not a plant, right? But we kind of throw the mushrooms in there. So if you've ever taken a walk in the woods and seen kind of a rainbow rust colored mushroom that is that is right right on the, sh the bottom of the tree, that's a rishi. So rishis are uh, had are grow all over the world, but there are certain species that grows in Asia has been studied by the Japanese and has been found to have all kinds of really wonderful anti-cancer properties. So Rishi is exceptionally. A couple of others, go to Kola from India, really good for brain health. Yeah, there are just so many others. A Japanese knotweed has resveratrol like grapes. It's a really mm -hmm. good antimicrobial and it's just, yeah, but there, there's some basic ones. And I encourage people, you know, don't, don't be intimidated. One of the reasons for writing the book is just to get people started on a core and, and those of those basic herbs that are really safe and the idea, you know, this is really foreign concept. I mean, everybody looks at herbs like drugs, you know, I've got this symptom, I need to take this herb to get rid of it. And where I've come in my journey is no, they're really protective and they're, and, and how they're working is they're restoring cellular health. And some herbs are really good for doing that for specific cells. So they have, you know, more specific actions, but that's how the herbs are working all the way around. So taking them, just that idea of taking herbs on a daily basis for prevention is novel. It's new. You know, we don't think of herbs that way, but wow, I think that's the, mo that's the most important way we should be looking at herbs. And again, you know, I've been taking these herbs continually for 15 years. The long-term studies of herbs doing that is really fantastic. When I was writing the book, I actually found a study showing that many of the herbs that I mentioned in the book have been found to be, when taken on a regular basis, actually reduce the risk of chronic illness and cancer across the board. So yeah, we're getting there. It's a new concept, but it is, well, I just think about what would happen if everybody in the country was taking just a handful of herbal capsules. You know, we want them to change their diet and everything else. But if they were doing that alone, I think we'd see a dent in chronic illness. I really do. Yeah, that's really powerful. I agree. And when you mix it together with cleaning up your lifestyle, prioritizing sleep, making sure that you're eating a really healthy diet, I mean, it becomes incredibly powerful. And how amazing. I talk a lot about herbs and, and supplements, I guess you'd say in general, because the beauty of them is that the majority of these don't really have any side effects. Whereas a lot of these pharmaceutical drugs right. that we're pushing, not only are they just band-aids, they're not addressing the root cause, but they're also creating more symptoms in the body. So then we just have another issue that we have to clean up. Whereas yeah. with these herbs, they're just coming in and they're they're helping at a cellular level and they're actually addressing the root cause. You know, I, I think that's a big difference. And, and you know, I think there's a there's a value. There, there's a purpose for every pharmaceutical made. But yeah. the primary purpose of pharmaceuticals and and surgical procedures is stabilizing illness you know when when the body is truly out of sorts stabilizing it can put it in a position of of being able to heal but the drugs themselves aren't really addressing these cellular stress factors so they're doing nothing to directly promote healing Whereas the herbs, that's where we can really do, do benefit by promoting the actual healing process by reducing cellular stress. When you reduce cellular stress, you, you reduce mitochondrial demands, you reduce nutrient demands, and cells get that opportunity that they need to start recovering and rebuilding. Mm. Yeah, wow. So on a cellular level, what are things that people can do to reduce their stress. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people are aware of meditation, which I think is really powerful on a cellular level as well. But from your findings on a, from a cellular perspective, how can we reduce some of our stress? You know, I, I broke, have broken it down to those five factors, just looking at that, you know, how, how can we counteract these primary stress factors? So 
the the thing that is affecting so many people in an adverse way is eating high levels of processed carbohydrates. And I know that you've spent a lot of time addressing this these issues. That's the big one, you know, and it's cutting those carbs down. I mean, I try to keep my dietary carbohydrate consumption below about 150 grams a day. I don't go ketogenic because ketogenic is just not comfortable. And I just don't think you have to go there. I but agree. keeping it below at least 200 was even better down below 150. Yeah, that gives you a little bit of room that you can enjoy food. Eating more vegetables than anything else. Vegetables are so important. A healthy protein sources, you know, chicken, fish. I eat more fish than other things and eggs. I'm not vegan, but I... I, I respect that. And I think you can be very healthy, but I think, you know, it's, it's easier. The, these other protein sources are really good and good for you. So food is important, but we do really a disservice with eating too much carbohydrates. It affects insulin levels. It affects everything in the body. Interestingly, when I was researching the book, I was aware of a few herbs that had anti-diabetic properties. But the more I searched, the more I found, and I actually found a study that documented that a couple of hundred herbs have been documented to, to have anti-diabetic properties, either protecting cells mm -hmm. from the adverse effects of carbohydrate or helping to normalize insulin. So the herbs can help there too. Second on the list is toxins. And man, we're, we're all getting pounded. You know, plastics, petroleum, heavy metals, which comes from coal, burning coal. All of these things are so much a part of our world and it's hard to get away from them. So taking steps to filter your water, eat clean food whenever possible. And, you know, do do the things you need that you need to do to clean your air, air filters, air purifiers. But maybe just living in a place where the air is clean can really be beneficial. Stress, wow, we're all getting hit with it. I mean, we're, we're just getting pummeled with stress. And that was the big thing for me is just stress and no sleep. And we all have to slow down and just take time during the day to de-stress and enjoy life. And the big thing is just prioritizing sleep. You know, mm -hmm. if you're watching intense television till 11 o'clock at night, you're not going to get good sleep that night. If you have to get up at seven the next morning, you're going to be sleep deprived. You really do need eight hours. Seven and a half to eight is is an, is, is is almost essential. Six and a half doesn't do it. And in that, you need deep sleep. And most people just aren't getting deep sleep. Exercise really important because it moves blood more than anything else. Exercise is important for moving blood. Now it does a lot of things. It normalizes stress hormones, increases endorphins, everything else, but your cells needed to be washed, you know, so when you when you exercise, you dilate blood vessels, you increase blood flow, and that opens those spaces in the vascular system to get to allow fluid to bathe our cells and wash them out, which is just helps pull away toxins, deliver nutrients, doing all the things that are so important for cellular health. And then finally, just that microbe component is really important. And that's where the herbs can help us, but just keeping our cells healthy. You know, you, we hear a lot about the immune system protecting us. So that's just one layer. So I divide up our defenses into three layers. So you have barriers, your skin, the intestinal lining that are trying, that are there designed to keep microbes out or microbes contained in the gut. And but they're leaking, things get across. Your immune system is your backup system when things get across. But the third layer is your cells can defend themselves. Our cells have the ability to expel microbes or you know contain microbes so they stay dormant if they're healthy. So when you lose cellular health, you lose your ability to not only manage this internal dormant microbiome but to protect yourself from new threats. Yeah, 
Oh, that's really important. And I like that you broke down all those pieces. I just read that chapter the other day in your book about all the different modalities and ways that we can protect ourselves, essentially. What do you think about other modalities such as like red, red light therapy for cellular health? Red light therapy is something, and I've been paying a lot of attention to. I don't have one myself. I'm I'm, I'm looking for an excuse to get one because I, I, I think what we're doing there is just we're energizing our cells. So our cells, uh, everything needs energy. Our cells need energy. And I think that we are just introducing uh, a subtle form of energy into the cell that helps energize it so it can recover from stress and do the things that it needs to do to function better. So I think that's what we're doing with red light therapy. There is a lot of great research on red light therapy out there. The only downside is it, boy, it, it's a free-for-all because of the research. They're just all kinds of products out there some good not some so, so some not so good and i don't know enough about it really at this point to to say well that one's absolutely good and that one's not so good but there are things like that so when i'm looking at therapies of any kind it's so is it is it something that stabilizes a condition when somebody's acutely ill or having you know a bad situation happen or other therapies the things that are promoting healing promoting wellness are going to be things that promote cellular health so i'm always looking asking that question is it affecting our cells in a positive way? You know, is it doing something to our cells to either energize them or, or reduce the toxin load or help the cell in some way to, to regain what it needs to function optimally? Okay, I love that. So I know you talk a lot about ancestral health, and this is something that I think is really important too, that we've lost a lot of our our, our wisdom and our intuition to what really truly means to be healthy. Yeah. Where does ancestral health tie into longevity? You know, it, it's, it is, it, it's how our cells are programmed. You know, that's how to think about it. All right. So I, I read a National Geographic article about here you're living in boiling water in rivers in Peru. There's these rivers that the temperature gets to 150 to 200 degrees and bacteria live there. They didn't just jump in. They adapted to being able to survive in that really high temperature over a, a very long period of time. And so it took thousands and thousands of generations. So that's what it takes to for the for to change genetic programming is repetitive exposure to different conditions than maybe we're adapted to so it takes thousands of years thousands of generations to change something so when you look at our ancestry for several hundred thousand years we ate a forage food diet which was basically wild plants, probably about two thirds plants, two thirds animal matter, but very lean animals. It was very low calorie. It was very high nutrient and it had a lot of fiber in it. And our guts are dependent on that. And we didn't start changing that until about 10,000 years ago, which on a timeline, you know, that's, that's an instant. And even when we started eating grain, we were still eating forage foods and other kinds of things. So it's only been in very recent history that we've shifted to this very high grain, high meat diet and fatty meat that are fed grains and beans. And our cells just aren't programmed for this. We're also not programmed for the toxins, all right? And a way to think about this is you know, most of the things that we consider toxic to us are either heavy metals or foreign, chem foreign organic chemicals. Those things didn't exist on the surface of the earth before a couple of hundred years ago. It wasn't until we started mining, specifically mining coal, which started about 3,000 years ago, that we started pulling these unnatural elements from the earth you know, and some of it happened with volcanoes and that sort of thing. But for the most part, living things weren't exposed to it. So now you look at the amount of coal that we've burned over the past several hundred years. 
And all coal has heavy metals in it, and it precipitates out in the water, in the air, and, you know, we're still doing it. Petroleum, if you went back millions of years ago and ate the algae and plant matter that became petroleum, it'd probably be good for you. But millions of years of heat and pressure have distorted those organic compounds that came from plants into forms that are just not compatible with biological life anymore. So when we when we take these things, it interrupts the normal organic compounds that our cells use, and it, it just clutters things with, th with, with stuff that the cell can't use. So that's why all these organic petroleums from petroleum and plastics, you know, they're, they're organic, but they are not forms that are compatible with life anymore. And we've just, we, we poured those out all over the earth and mm. it's so, yeah, it's, 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 you know, the other side of petroleum is, you know, we've got great food systems. We can travel, we can live in air conditioned homes. It's just, we've got a lot of people now, you know, when I was born, there were 3 billion people on earth. Now there's 7.8. And it's, uh, and everybody wants the same standard of life that we have, and they probably deserve it. You know, everybody yeah. should. So we have to find better ways of doing that. And, and we, we have to respect the value of petroleum, but at the same time say, you know, we, we just can't live with this. And we, we, we really have to start managing these chemicals. So it's not just about global warming. I'm more concerned about the toxin threat than I Me am too. that because, you know, it's, uh, we're seeing more, more chronic illness every year. 60% of the American population is defined as chronically ill. WHO last month released a statement suggesting that cancer has become epidemic worldwide. Mm -hmm. And it's because of all of these things inhibit cellular health and, you know, allow the microbes to flourish in our body and, and compromise our cellular functions. And that leads to all kinds of internal problems. Yeah, this is a huge issue that I talk about often on my podcast because it's all connected, you know, because yeah. we're we're storing our food in plastic and then the plastic chemicals are leaching into the food. And then as well as our tap water, you mentioned earlier, it's full of all these chemicals that are running off from the pesticides and yeah. um, and all of these plants and the factories. I mean... It, it's a really big issue and it's causing disruption to our endocrine systems. And this to me is the most concerning right now. And this is why I encourage people. And I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this. Cause I don't like to leave people with this hanging kind of doom and gloom um, to support your detoxification pathways, because we can only do so much, you know, it, I encourage people to eat whole real foods as much as possible. Stop buying so much stuff in packages and stop buying foods in plastic. Yep. Don't heat your food up in plastic. There's only so much we can do, you know, to a certain extent we have to say, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. And I encourage people to sweat, do sauna if you can work out. What are some yep. other things that you would suggest for people to do? And, you know, I think you're, you're right on target with those things. And it's, we can do things as individuals, and that's a good. And that's the good news. But we also have to start doing smarter things as a society, as a culture. Yeah. We really need to start paying better attention to these things. And 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 it is an issue. And and every year the statistics grow more sound that it is something that is a, a significant threat. It's hard to deal with because we don't see the the immediate effects you know they're cumulative over time and it's this just chronic low grade exposure yeah i think i think it's time for us to start moving on it as a society what i do, you know i was fortunate enough to find a place to live that is on a marsh and you know we get good clean air off off of the water we change the filters in our house we filter our water and I, you know, I, I make all my food from scratch. I mean, we buy fresh vegetables. I, you know, I eat a ton of vegetables every week and we just don't buy anything that I can buy that's not in a package. I do. So we're doing a lot of things to protect ourselves, my family and I, and that pays off. It feels really good, but I think we still have to be looking at that from a whole society point of view. 
Absolutely. And I, I'm, I'm happy that it's being talked about on a wide scale level right now. And like you said, you know, people are, are concerned more about it from the lens of climate change, which is obviously a huge concern, but I, I take it a step further like you. And I say, this is a huge concern from a toxic burden level and the way that we are not thriving and living our best anymore because we're being so uh, run down by all these toxins. And what you said, I think is really important to point out again, is that it's a cumulative over time. I did a, a post recently on my Instagram a couple of days ago about candles and burning them in your home and how toxic it is because of these fragrances yeah. and all the chemicals that they put in the wax. Yeah. And I had a woman comment and she said, well, I've been burning these for, I don't remember the timeline, but she said something like 40 years and I'm fine. And I was just thinking, Oh man. I mean, at some point, I hope not, I don't wish this on her, but I was thinking at some point that's going to catch up with her. And yeah. I don't like this mentality that it seems that a lot of us have is that, well, I'm fine now, so I'm going to be okay. And I don't say this to scare people, but I say to remember that just because you don't feel the effects of it right now, doesn't mean that it's not having an effect on yourselves. That's right. Yeah. You know, people smoke for 40 years too, but sooner or later, I mean, it, it, it does take years off their life, but, but more importantly, I think that it hinders life. You're not reaching your full capacity, you know? And I, again, I'm aging, but at age 65, my brain is sharp. My body is sharp. I can do the things that I want to do. I can fully engage in life in a very productive way. And we all want to keep that. I mean, that's what life is all about. And I see people losing it when they're in their 40s, you know, mm. and they're just letting something precious go and it just kind of slips away. And yeah, they can live like that for 40 years or longer and drugs will keep you alive, but you just won't lose your full potential. That was so beautifully said and important for people to hear. So before we go, is there anything that you have not covered about the cellular wellness solution or really anything Ooh. that we should talk about? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in that book for sure. I know. It's yeah, I I I but I it, it was hard to know, you know, what to leave out. So there's a, there's a lot of great information. I mean, it's really everything that I've learned so far up until I published the book. Everything that I learned for my whole career. Still learning though. You know, I'm still learning all things are. since since the book has been published. But the big thing is just thinking at that cellular level and thinking about health in terms of cellular health and how we can keep our cells healthy, this slows down the aging process and, and it just keeps you functioning, keeps you, keeps you at your full potential. Really super important. Yeah. Well, and I said this earlier, I like the way the book is set up. It really feels like a guidebook. I literally have it next to my computer right now. And I've been enjoying it a lot. Thanks. And it's full of a lot of a lot of wisdom that I think people need to hear. Well, thank you. Then I have accomplished my goal. Yay. I oh, love that. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question that I ask all of my guests. And right. I'm very curious to hear what yours are. What are your health non-negotiables? So these are things that no matter how busy your day is, you take the time to prioritize prioritize these for your health? Eat good food, sleep and exercise, you know, and I try to walk a minimum of three miles a day. And that's my minimum or the equivalent. I eat well, just eating good food. That, that's so remarkably important. And I uh, making sure I get that sleep every night. I'm just so protective of my sleep now, because it's so essential to staying well. It really is. And you feel it when you're not getting good sleep. Yeah, it really for sure. infiltrates in your whole day. And, and I take my herbs every day. Boy, that's an essential too. No doubt about that one. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, please tell people where they can find you and where they can find your book. The book can be found on Amazon. And it's, I've been pleased that so far we have over a hundred five-star reviews of people that really wrote some sincere compliments. So that was really nice. I think people are really getting what I wanted for them out of the book. And the website, which we will have more information, is cellularwellness.com. We have another site called RawlsMD 
that is more for a chronic illness audience of helping people that are more desperately ill. And it's got lots of information there. Less focus on wellness, though. And then finally, vitalplan.com is I am medical director and co-founder of Supplement Company just to really promote good quality supplements that people can rely on and the education for how to use them. So that's something my daughter and I have been doing for about 10 years mm. that I get a lot of pleasure out of. Awesome. Well, I'm going to leave all those links in the show notes so people can check them out. I just pulled up Vital Plan and this looks great. I'm excited to dive into that. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast today. Well, don't, thank you so much for the opportunity. It, it was a real pleasure.